I'd like to start by uh, thanking you, Link, for uh, not only inviting me here, but for inventing this, because I really think this is an exciting technology, and I'll try to share my excitement with you uh, in the context we have uh, developed. Um, first, I'd like to disclose my disclosures. I'm a consultant to Genoptics Novartis and Perkin Elmer uh, Caliper, uh, and some of this work is supported by grants from them, and also an author on the Yalehead Aqua technology patent, which I'll talk to you about today. So um, maybe this is redundant, but what I did is RT-PCR on two masterpieces. One is a Monet, the other is a Renoir. Which is which? Now, usually there's, all the information is here, it's just ground up. So here's all the colors and here's the intensities here. And so is there an art history major in the room who can tell me which is which? Sometimes someone raises their hand and says, well, the one on the right's a Monet because look at all that light blue. And he's really big on light blue but I have yet to have someone tell me that this is the boating party and this is the stroll. And that's the importance of two-dimensional information. And that's why we want to do things in situ, not grind things up when we discover, when we try to do analyses and maximize the information we can gain from patient tissue. So here's an, a real-life a real example. This is a specimen that we recently have looked at, a breast cancer specimen. And this breast cancer specimen contains a lot of things that if you grind up, you're, you're combining into one thing. Here's the invasive ductal carcinoma. Here's DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ. And here's the stroma. And they all have very different roles in the biology of breast cancer. Grind them up and mix them together, and you're not going to be able to find out the kinds of things you can find out with assays that are in situ based. So I've spent my career trying to develop quantitative in situ assays. Unfortunately, the, um, the history of quantitative in situ assays is sort of checkered. They've always been based on immunoperoxidase, which is this brown stain here, which actually, if you talk to Clive Taylor, was not developed to be quantitative, but was rather developed to be binary. It's either on or off, and that's what it's used for here. And in fact, the strength of this assay is not the on or off, it's the counter stain with hematoxylin that tells you, in this particular case, that this is thyroglobulin positive tumor over here, which means this is a thyroid cancer, not a cancer from some other source. And here's some lymphocytes and some stroma that tells you that it's in a lymph node. But it was the hematoxylin, not the DAB, that was most important. And so, unfortunately, uh, we've tried to quantitate that, and that's led to some challenges that I'll share with you initially, talking about why we chose fluorescence, and then I'll give you some examples of using uh, the RNA scope technology with fluorescence quantification. So here's another little test for you all. Um, it's not showing up so well on that projector. Uh, but which is darker, A or B? I'm not sure if you can even see the B square there, or the A square there. And this is what we do with brown stain every day, is we try to figure out which is darker. And what we do is we use context. We don't use intensity, because the human eye isn't built for this. And so here's an example where you can see that they're exactly the same color. And some pathologists, when I showed this, said, well, these are different images. So I had to add this so that they would actually believe that they were the same image and, in fact, represent the human eye's inability to tell the difference between subtle shades of gray. And so for that reason, we should probably move to a more quantitative system. The other problem is that when you use these subtle shades of gray and then you counter stain with hematoxylin, you lose it. And so actually, if you take a look at what hematoxylin is, it's a uh, extract that's a natural dye that you extract by boiling wood of the South American West Indian logwood tree. So that's pretty interesting but it's not very technical and it's not very reproducible. And so we suffer all kinds of problems from trying to use hematoxylin. And here's an example of one. This is clearly an ER positive case if you leave out the hematoxylin, but if you put it in, it's ER negative. And so this is what can happen if you put in too much hematoxylin. And it, it's a great way to reduce your signal to noise by dramatically hiding all your noise. But it also hides your signal. And so um, this is another reason that we've moved away from DAB signaling. And finally, we looked at dynamic range, and this is a recent, very recent comparison of dynamic range of fluorescence versus DAB on this axis. And you can see the rapid plateauing that you get with DAB, where you have less than a full log of, high, of dynamic range compared to just over two logs of dynamic range with fluorescence. So for that reason, and this is an example of uh, staining with SP1 antibody, a common estrogen receptor antibody, by both uh, fluorescence in the blue and DAB in the brown, and you can see that it rapidly plateaus. And then when you get around the plateau, you get a lot of variability that isn't linear. So for these reasons, we've moved to fluorescence. 
So how do we do fluorescence? We use a technology that we invented about 10 years ago that we started calling automated quantitative analysis. That's what AQUA stands for, but subsequently been trademarked. And it's based that we're trying to find a concentration, but we want to in situ without grinding it up. And the concentration is nothing more than a numerator over a denominator. So our numerator is the sum of the intensity of the pixels within the compartment that we define. And then the denominator is the area of the compartment. And that's all you have to do to get a concentration on a slide. That's what we call an aqua score. We also define the region of interest often so that you don't get the blank spaces with cytokeratin for carcinomas or S100 for melanomas, et cetera. And then ultimately, when you get this aqua score, you have to convert it to a, a set of standards. And ultimately, that standardization turns out to be very important as well, that you do it every time. So this is sort of what it looks like where you take a, a mask and then you take a, uh, a region of interest. In this case, we're looking at nuclei, so we use DAPI to find the compartment. And then any, we measure the total area of the DAPI compartment pixels and then the total intensity of all the estrogen receptor pixels and divide them, pr provided that they're under the cytokeratin mask, and that generates an aqua score. So it's quantitative and it's objective. And those are two things that we had difficulty achieving with other, other methodologies. Um, so this is a much younger me when we'd invented this about 10 years ago, and the technology was subsequently commercialized by this company, HistoRx, and delivered on different platforms, one from Perkin Elmer and one from Aperio, and about a month ago was bought by Genoptics, who has commercialized this technology and now provides us to clinical patients in their lab um, for estrogen receptor, uh, HER2, PGR, and K67. Um, where it will go from here is to be determined but uh, that since the um, purchase was just of the company was just about a week ago, or a month ago rather, um, we'll, we'll keep your eye on this space. It's very reproducible. This is uh, work done by HistoRx looking at multiple slides, multiple operators, multiple days, and, co and calculating a coefficient of variation. And for estrogen receptor and HER2, it's consistently under 5%. So then now let's move to measuring RNA, because although we've used this historically ex exclusively for measuring protein, we've now started measuring RNA. And I'm not going to introduce again the RNA scope since it was so beautifully introduced to you by Yuling, other than to say that this was an extremely clever idea. Because back uh, a long time ago, as he said, we've been doing RNA for a long time. And the problem is we could never get the signal to noise that we needed in order to get quantification. And what we had to do was come up with some trick to dramatically increase the signal to noise. And as you see, these double Zs were just the trick to do that. Uh, this is just the, from the paper that was described uh, showing that the signal to noise is so dramatically increased. Now I'm going to show you a bunch of fluorescent images that probably aren't going to show up in this room night, so you might have to take my word for it. But uh, these are examples of different things that we've looked at um, with the RNA in situ hybridization. Uh, and you can just see the uh, UBC is a positive control, DAB-B is a negative control, and then EPCAM is, this, is the signal spot. And we always look at it under a cytokeratin mask. So after you, do the, um, after you do the full protocol for the uh, mRNA, you can also then do cytokeratin on top of that. It works just fine. It doesn't destroy the epitopes. So you can create a mask and then read an area of interest. So this, this then becomes our denominator for our concentration. And then the number of signals that we see, not counting the signal, but the intensity of the signal, is the numerator. And the beauty of this system is the DAB-B and the UBC, and I'll explain that in a second. Oops. So when you, whenever we run an assay, we actually run a DAB-B and a UBC at the same time on serial sections of the array, and we're working, uh, we'd like to work with uh, ACD to have this be able to be done on a single section, because what you can tell is that any time that this sort of validates your tissue that says the RNA is okay, that's the UBC. And then the DAB-B tells you what your baseline is, where your noise is. And you can see in this assay where the noise is, is right around 25 or 30. And so in every case, you know what your signal to noise is. You have validated that your tissue is functional for the assay, and it gets around the huge problem in immunohistochemistry of preanalytic variables. So in, in immunohistochemistry, chemistry, you never know if your tissue is competent for the antibody that you're trying to bind. With RNA scope, you do know. And you can tell by just doing the UBC. And so if it doesn't work on the UBC, then you can throw that tissue out or exclude it 
or otherwise uh, disregard that data because you know that the, the tissue is not competent, if you will, for this assay. The second really strength of this technology is the DAB-B. So the DAB-B tells you what your noise is. So I once got a review back from some reviewer from some journal I won't embarrass that said, oh, if, you're, if you still have noise, you just need to dilute your reagents down more. No, every assay has noise. And you just a question of where it is and whether or not you see it. And in fact, it's good to know where the noise is because then you know what your dynamic range is in your assay. And in fact, that's what we see here. As you can see, the DAB-B produces the noise, and it may not be hybridization, it may be from secondary reagents, but whatever it is, there's always a very low level that you're going to get of noise in any given assay. And so this tells you on a tissue-specific basis what the noise is for your assay for that specific tissue. And so ultimately, you can even subtract out your noise, which is what we ultimately hope to do. Right now, we're just sort of using it as a baseline, as I'll show you in a minute. So um, the examples that I want to show you today are three examples. I'll first show you estrogen receptor alpha. And this is published work that was published in uh, PLOS1. And then some new data on P10 and PDL1, which are two new um, at, two applications that we've been using uh, this technology for. So the first is for estrogen receptor alpha, and this is ESR1, is the RNA for it. And you can see it kind of looks like a fish assay. But the difference between a DNA fish and RNA-ish uh, is that you get different intensity spots and a lot of those spots are overlapping. So occasionally you have overlapping spots certainly on DNA signals as well, but that makes it hard to quantitate by counting spots and, I, and, and is the argument that we use for quantitating by intensity as opposed to spot counting because overlapping spots can, can confound a counting-based system. So uh, in order to validate sensitivity and specificity, we looked at a bunch of cell lines, which we know do or do not express estrogen receptor. And although you can't see it too well here, all the lines that are ER positive are above the baseline. The baseline's delivered again by the DAB-B. All of the lines are valid by the UBC. And then you can see these three lines are negative, and then these five lines are ER positive. And so that validates the sensitivity and specificity of the assay in a cell line system. And then the next thing you always want to do is show reproducibility. And using tissue microarrays, we've looked at uh, different cuts. In some cases, this is not quite serial sections, cut 6 versus 13 in a uh, test array, showing very high levels of reproducibility of measuring the RNA using this system. This is the UBC reproducibility. And then these are some large cohorts. These are um, about 240 and, and 280 cases of um, breast cancer where we're looking at the reproducibility of the assay. And what we look for is the R squared and the slope. And you can see the slopes are pretty good, and the R squareds are fairly good at 0.7. They can be as low as 0.5. Um, that usually refers to the heterogeneity. So we're, lot, we're not looking at just reproducibility, but because we're looking at serial sections, we're also somewhat monitoring tumor heterogeneity. And so you can see a little bit more heterogeneity in this one than in this one. What we also found when we started looking at the controls, that is the UBC, is that you, you can validate your tissue for whether or not it's going to work. And you can see that this is looking at a cohort by year. And we had a few early cases. The bulk of the cases were past 1993. But you can see every case before 1993 was not valid for this assay. Now, I don't know what it, why it wasn't valid. We don't know if it was older, it's just simply age, which we don't think it is, or something that we were using before 1993 in our fixative that was preventing the RNA from being very well fixed or some combination thereof. You can see the protein works. There's no difference in the protein. They're roughly equivalent um, when there's enough. But then we looked at some other institutions, in fact, uh, looking at tissue as old as 1988, and we still had pretty good range and dynamic range in the assays, unlike the, uh, the Yale tissue. So we really believe this was an artifact of our institution, but it allows you to know that. It's a really valuable piece of information to sort of be able to evaluate your tissue for the competency of, being a, of, of the given assay that you're trying to do. The other thing that's really interesting that was, is this result, where we have ESR1, the RNA, on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we have protein. Now, RNA makes, you know, the central dogma, DNA makes RNA makes protein. Well, Yes, but not exactly. There's a lot of sort of other things that determine what levels of protein are going to be present. That is, there's the fact that proteins can be degraded more rapidly or can have a longer half-life than the RNA. 
And so while the ratio is, or why the relationship is generally positive, it's not linear. And very interestingly, for estrogen receptor, we found that you can have very high levels of protein with relatively low levels of RNA, or very low levels of protein with relatively low levels of RNA. And so the RNA is actually giving you a, a completely independent piece of information from the protein. And I think that this, in combination of the protein, may be very valuable in the future for understanding information about patients and being able to predict responses to therapy. And we've actually, this is two separate cohorts. This is a, uh, a newer cohort, all from the 2000s, and then this is our older cohort, eliminating the cases from before 1993. And you can see they have pretty much the same shape. Um, and uh, we're still now validating this in further cohorts, larger cohorts, and, and from various uh, times to see if we can find this relationship to outcome. So the relationship, uh, here's another example of uh, still another cohort. This is actually an older cohort, goes back into the 80s. And again, we see the same general relationship where RNA is proportional to protein, but not directly related. There's a lot more going on than that. And then this is HER2. Similarly, there's cases that are fairly variable. The same level of mRNA can generate a fairly wide range of protein. And that may actually, in, in data that I won't show you today, we have some preliminary evidence that combining those two is much more powerful in predicting response to trastuzumab than either one alone. So is it prognostic or predictive? And we have outcome information in all these cases. And interestingly, the RNA was not prognostic. That is, looking at high versus low, just with respect to outcome, was not informative. But once you added tamoxifen to the equation in these patients, it was highly predictive. That is, when the, when the ESR1 the RNA was high, then you could see that there was a good difference between the tamoxifen negatives and the tamoxifen positives. The treated patients did much better. Whereas if the mRNA is low, there's much less difference. So it's almost kind of like ER negative, ER positive, but not exactly. It actually gives different information than the estrogen receptor. And this has been published, but we're in the process of validating this and testing the RNA for its independent predictive value when compared to uh, outcome in response to tamoxifen. So to summarize the ESR1 data, um, it can be accurately measured in situ. It's related to the, pro to the ER alpha protein but the relationship is complex. The protein's prognostic and predictive, and we've known that for years, but ESR appears to be predictive, but not so much prognostic in early studies, which may be, uh, which still needs to be validated. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is P10, and this is now new data that hasn't been shown, um, but asking the sort of the same kinds of questions. So we know P10 is really a hard protein to work with, and the antibodies are miserable, some of them work, some of them don't, they're hard to read, et cetera. So we thought, well, what about the RNA? Maybe we could access that information because P10 is so important in regulating the PI3 kinase signaling pathway. And so what we did is looked at, it, at this index array block that was made for us by Rachel Schiff where we, so we could validate not only the protein assays but the RNA assays. And the index as a, array has a time course of induction of P10 uh, SHRNA. So as you go for longer times, you should see decreased amounts of the RNA because their SHRNA is added. Or as you add more and more of the doxycycline, you should see increased amounts uh, or decreased amounts of P10. And that's what you can see here in a Western blot where you can knock down the P10. So this is made into this little array, and then we can look at it and see how well it validates with the RNA scope assay. And that's what we've done. And you can see the mRNA, actually can't see it very well, uh, but it's quantitated over here that as we induce more and more of the shRNA, you can see the RNA goes down with the, uh, for the P10-specific mRNA, but DAB-B stays pretty much the same. So validating the, M the mRNA assay. And then finally, in the other um, direction, whoops, I guess that one's not going to show up. Sorry about that. Um, but just to show then the assays themselves, uh, looking at P10 mRNA and protein and comparing the two, and that's what we'll, we'll do next. And in fact, I can show you what they look like. This is the same spot. And this is what the RNA looks like, and this is what the protein looks like in that spot. So you can, you can still quantitate it, but it, it's not, again, we're going to see a relationship that's not linear. And so here's the P10 mRNA here, and here's the protein here. And you can see that there's almost a spray of, of the, of the complementary um, protein versus RNA in the same cases. And this one has an R squared of about 0.15, so that's much, less, much lower than we see for protein, but it's still kind of going in the right direction. It's still following the central dogma, just not as closely as we all might have assumed. 
Um, this is just simply reproducibility here, showing that when we look at the RNA, we still get very high, high levels of reproducibility. That is, this isn't, doesn't represent tumor heterogeneity. This resent, represents the difference between RNA and protein expression. And this is the cohort that we did this on. I showed you this a little bit before. But this cohort has a bunch of patients that were treated with tamoxifen or tamoxifen and chemo. And we can look at now to see and determine whether or not the P10 is predictive to response to therapy. This is the, my lab group. A lot of the work that I showed you was done by Vamsi and Kurt working on the mRNA and, and uh, Jennifer Bordeaux, who did all the estrogen receptor work. Um, Li Ping is the collaborator that provided all the PDL1 data or the PDL1 uh, antibody. And um, Rachel Schiff is the one who provided the uh, P10 data uh, standardization. And then this is the whole group, and this is our website here. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you.